looking to increase performance while dropping weight, then look no further than the front of your car, where in today's video, we're installing and reviewing the Wagner Evo 2 Competition Intercooler on the M235i. Let's get into it. What's up everybody, my name is Fritz and welcome to the channel. Where in today's video, we're installing and reviewing the Wagner Tuning Evo 2 Competition Intercooler on the M235i. And as a side note, Wagner did make another intercooler just like this in their performance line. But because the performance aspects, no pun intended, as well as the sales of this intercooler outshined that one so much, they stopped production of that specific intercooler. But if you're like me and picking up one of these intercoolers used, you're gonna wanna know which one you're getting. Because of the application of your car, you might see better gains from one versus the other. The competition series uses a tube and fin design that's better for people who have longer commutes and see more free flowing traffic. But if you have shorter commutes with stop and go traffic, perhaps the bar and plate method of the performance model will be better for you. So it doesn't really have to deal with whether or not your car is a daily or if you track it. It really depends on what kind of driving and what kind of airflow passes through the intercooler. Now, two more things to consider with intercooler design are price and weight. Because although the tube and fin intercooler may weigh less, it actually costs more, at least in the case with Wagner's intercoolers. And this is actually gonna be a good review video because we do have a bar and plate intercooler on the M235i right now from BRSF. Specifically, their six and a half inch stepped intercooler with HD fins. And because I have two different commutes throughout the week, one is a 10 minute drive with pretty heavy traffic, as well as a longer commute 30 to 45 minutes, but with free flowing traffic, we're gonna be able to tell how long it takes to heat soak these intercoolers, as well as what effect that has on the intake temperatures. But first, we have to install this intercooler on the M235i. Since lowering the car, I've needed help from this small jack to reach the front center jack point. In order to have enough clearance to pull the intercooler out, I went to the fourth notch on the jack stands, which is about 13 and a half inches with the puck. This will also give us enough access to remove all of the 8mm screws holding in the under panel. Now we can unclip the intercooler from the boost pipe and charge pipe. With the locking tabs off, slide the clip up and off of its groove. Let's also unsecure our radiator hose and move it out of the way before removing the screws that hold in the intercooler. VRSF uses Phillips screws while the OEM design uses a T25. If you have a three-piece charge pipe like the one from VRSF, it's easier if you loosen or remove the lower portion. But for those of you with the OEM pipe and intercooler, this part is easier as well because the original intercooler is much smaller. In either case, I would upgrade at least the charge pipe as well if you're already here. To bring it down, I found it was best to wiggle down the passenger side first, then tilt out the driver side. Now we can compare all three intercoolers side by side. Right away we can see that we have much more cooling capacity from both aftermarket solutions. And they also have full metal end tanks. So no matter what, they are both clear upgrades from OEM but both are also heavier from the 7.8 pound OEM intercooler. The Evo 2 comes in at 19.6 pounds and VRSF is 27.8 pounds. So let me know your opinion. Are we really dropping 8.8 .8 pounds up front or are we adding 11.8? Then when we look at just the Wagner and VRSF intercoolers, we do have a slight difference in their fin to fin dimensions. The VRSF intercooler has the most cooling capacity with a 75.92% volume increase from OEM versus Wagner's 64.75% increase. Wagner also has the vertical guides to help align the intercooler properly into place. The last design difference is inside the hot side where the boost pipe feeds into. Both the Wagner and OEM intercoolers have this lip to help separate the incoming air, but this is absent on the VRSF design. When we get to the testing portion, we'll see if any of these measurements or design differences have an impact on performance. 
When pushing in the intercooler, you'll need to tilt the fan back and push past the shroud. Expect some resistance, but no cutting is required. Once you get past the shroud, align the ends of the intercooler with the charge pipe and boost pipe. Then ensure both vertical guides are in alignment and push it in the rest of the way through. Now we can clip on our charge pipe and boost pipe. If you have the same ones, the pins on the clip point towards the pipes away from the intercooler. Wagner also includes hardware, but my used one did not come with it. So I went ahead and reused the OEM screws. Lastly, reinstall your coolant hose, place back on the under panel and lower down the car. As for our test results, during the 10 minute drive, neither VRSF or Wagner's intercooler seemed to fully heat soak as the intake temps were below 30 degrees Celsius, but both got as high as 28 degrees. During the 30 to 45 minute commute, I did notice both would heat soak around the 25 minute mark, depending on traffic. VRSF would get as hot as 32 degrees Celsius and Wagner could top out at 35. But once traffic started to flow again, VRSF's intake temps would drop to 18 degrees Celsius and Wagner could get as low as 16 degrees. Although this could be due to slight variations in ambient temperatures, the weather and climate was pretty consistent during our test. However, this does align with our thesis that a tube and fin intercooler can bring in colder air if the car is cruising. It also showed that in stop and go traffic up to 45 minutes, it can bring in hotter air. So I would say both are great intercoolers, but depending on your driving conditions, one will be better than the other. And if you're buying brand new, you'll also have to consider if those additional benefits are worth that difference in price. And with all that in mind, hopefully this video has given you enough information to install as well as the confidence to select the proper intercooler for your BMW. But if you're picking up a used one as we did in today's video and still are unsure on how to tell the differences between a bar and plate intercooler, when you look at the front of the intercooler, if you have a small gap right where the fins meet the end tank, then this is indicative of a tube and fin design. But if it appears that those fins go past that meeting point and you have a pointy prominence on the bar section, then you probably have a bar and plate intercooler. And this is evident on both the Wagner and VRSF intercoolers. You can also jump on the company's website to see if they have any other defining features that can help you separate between the two different types of intercoolers. If you have a serial number displayed on the listing, you could also call the company and see if they could run the serial number and give you additional information. But that's all the things that you can do while just looking at the pictures on the listing. Because it's hard to get a picture inside the end tank, once you actually have the intercooler in hand, take a look inside and with the stepped intercooler, you should see two different sets of fins completely separated from one another. Then you know for sure that you have a tube and fin intercooler. If it looks like it's one entire segment welded together, then that's your bar and plate intercooler. But if you feel that I left something out, please leave any questions that you have down in the comment section below. If you need any of the resources at all, it's gonna be down in the description links. And don't forget to leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos. And I'll see all of you in the next one.